we are taking a look at 2003. We are going back in time, and there are two big things that happened this night. One, Roman Polanski wins the Oscar for Best Director for a film called The Pianist. Now, Roman Polanski was not there to accept the award because he is, and was at that time, a literal fugitive. And the reason is because he drugged and raped a girl back in 1977 was when this all came out. Uh, this girl, Samantha Geimer, was 13 years old at the time, and he drugged and raped her and pleaded guilty to it. But he was afraid that the judge would give him an extended prison sentence. So he literally fled the United States of America and went to France, where he still currently lives with his family. So here's Roman Polanski winning the Oscar. When all the arts and sciences of motion pictures bring movies to life. It is the director who gives them their pulse. And here are the nominees for the 75th Achievement in Directing. For Chicago, Rob Marshall. For oh, Gangs of New York, Martin Scorsese. For The Hours, Stephen Daldry. For The Pianist, Roman Polanski. For Talk to Her, Pedro Almodovar. He's not there. They had to use a picture of him because he is a literal fugitive due to being a rapist. Goes for Roman Polanski for the pianist. Standing ovation is what this mother got. Standing ovation. You hate to see it. Also, just see who was right here. But um but um Harvey Weinstein. Of course, all in the same club. Yeah. The Academy congratulates Roman Polanski and accepts this award on his behalf. Yeah. yeah, so he couldn't even go up and get his award. The Academy accepts the award on his behalf. They did not need to give Roman Polanski that Oscar. You know, there were four other contenders who made excellent films. Martin Scorsese, Gangs of New York. Hello, right? Like it's fucked up enough that he got nominated for The Pianist, but to win, you saw the talent that was in that room, right? <laughs> like there are people who could have won that Oscar over him and they still gave it to him and people still stood up and applauded. All right, so here is Michael Moore winning his Oscar for Bowling for Columbine. So Bowling for Columbine was the documentary that Michael Moore made about gun violence and mass shootings. It was a response to the mass shooting at Columbine. And unfortunately, it is a documentary that is still relevant today. And here he is accepting his award and delivering a very iconic speech. Oscar goes to Bowling for Columbine. Michael Moore and Michael Donovan. Thank you very much. Uh, on uh, behalf of our producers, Kathleen Glenn and Michael Donovan from Canada, um, I'd like to thank the Academy for this. I've invited uh, my fellow documentary nominees on the stage with us and we would like to they are here they are here in solidarity with me because we like nonfiction we like nonfiction and we live in fictitious times we live in a time where we have fictitious ele election results that elects a fictitious president we we live in a time where we have a man sending us to war for fictitious reasons whether it's the fictitious of duct tape or the fictitious of orange alerts, we are against- He's like, hell yeah, brother. Speak your truth, baby. This war, Mr. Bush. Shame on you, Mr. Bush. Shame on you. And anytime you've got the Pope and the Dixie Chicks against you, your time is up. Thank you very much. So yeah, I mean, he ate that up. Now listen, this was a time where once again in Hollywood, like there were feuds. There were celebrity feuds going on between people who believed in the war, right? They were pro-war and they were pro-Bush and then ones who were outspoken. Michael Moore was not the only outspoken celebrity in Hollywood against the war. It's just that, you know, this was probably the biggest moment at that time because he went up on the Oscars stage, which, mind you, tens of millions of people watched the Oscars and decided to make that moment 
about the war and about Bush and said, shame on you. And it was, it was iconic. It was epic. Okay, so this is him backstage. Congratulations to you. Thank you. I would venture to say that you probably made the uh, largest scene at an Oscar ceremony since uh, Vanessa Redgrave's reference to Zionist hoodlums in 1978. Uh, one wonders, did you get the reaction that you were looking for, and why did you do what you did? I'm an American. That's it? Oh, that's a lot. I mean, you stirred the place up like I've never heard it stirred up before. I'm an American, and you don't leave your citizenship when you enter the doors of the Kodak Theater. What's great about this country is that you're able to speak your mind, and that's what I do. I do that in my filmmaking, I do that in my daily life, and I don't stop being who I am uh, when I come into this uh, ceremony. And I'm extremely grateful for the response. Mr. Uh, Moore, Miguel Morales, Voice of America, Latin American Division. Now that you have won an Oscar, would you be concerned about being blacklisted in Hollywood? Well, I don't work in Hollywood. I'm funded by Canadians and others who don't live here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was Hollywood who voted for this award. It was Hollywood that uh, stood uh, when it was announced. Don't report this, that there was a split decision in the hall because five loud people booed. The, Do your he's job. making such a good point here that these journalists are trying so hard to focus on the people who were booing, right? And they're like, wow, it's so contentious. You are, you know, you're getting out there and being controversial. And Michael Moore's like, no, it's not controversial. I won the Oscar. And yeah, there were a couple people who loudly booed, but there were also many, many, many who stood up and clapped and who have also been outspoken against this war and against George Bush. So don't report on this and pretend like it's some big divide in Hollywood, just like it's some big divide in the country. He calls their ass out. Do your job and tell the truth. This is how this, not only this town feels, but the majority of Americans did not support us getting into this war. The majority of Americans are not for Bush's policies. They're not for drilling in Alaska. Go down the whole damn list. The majority of Americans oppose what Bush stands for. The majority of your fellow Americans are pro-choice, they're pro-environment, they're, pro they're pro-labor, and that's the truth. And I'm sorry to have to, you know, speak it, but uh, I, I don't know what else to do. Michael, to your left, it's Sam Rubin from KTLA. How are you? Congratulations yeah. to you both. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, when the headline is not Chicago sweeps the Oscars, some are going to say Michael Moore hijacks the Oscars. That even those who agree with you, that you put Hollywood in a bad light and you've screwed up tonight and all that. What do you say about all that? I say that I, tonight I put America in a good light. I showed how, how vital it is to have free speech in our country and that all Americans have a right to stand up for what they believe in. I certainly don't feel that I did that. I don't think the people out there um, felt that. I mean, come on, let's just get real here. I, I'm not, I've been around for a few years, for 13 years now since Roger and me. I've got the number one selling book in the country this week. It's been on the bestseller list now for 53 weeks in LA and 48 weeks in New York on the New York Times list. More Americans have bought my book in the last year than any other nonfiction book something called Stupid White Men, essentially starring George W. Bush, at a time when he was supposedly enjoying great popularity ratings. My finger's on the pulse of where I believe the majority of Americans are at, and it would be irresponsible of me to not uh, say how I felt. And I think anybody voting for me for this award uh, knew that they weren't going to get a speech thanking agents, lawyers, lawyers of agents and agents of lawyers. You know, that's just who I am. I'm, I'm an honest and sincere person. I feel strongly about what I believe in, but I also are, love the art of cinema. I love going to a good movie, and every time I set out to make a movie, first thing I think about is what would I like to go see on a Friday night? Not what political message I wanna make, not what you know, thing I wanna cover, but what would make a great movie where after two hours, people would walk out of the theater going, wow, that was a great film. How often do we get that experience? It's so rare, and that's what I set out to do. That's what I hope I did with this film, and I'm honored to receive this award. One of the final thing I want to say about what you said about hijacking, while I was walking up the aisle, I invited all my fellow nominees to come up on the stage with me. And they all, and, 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 and I said, you know, I told them during the commercial break, you know, if you wanted to come with me, I'd love for you to come with me, but I'm gonna, it, but come only if you want to be in solidarity with me, because I'm going to speak out against 
this war and against Bush. And, and they were thrilled, and I was thrilled <laughs> to have them share the stage with me and not just be, have it be about Michael Moore or Michael Donovan or Kathleen Glenn, uh, but, but all of us who work in nonfiction, you work in nonfiction, and it's important. It's important because it speaks truth to the fiction that's out there. It's so critical these days. We need to reclaim our country. I love my country. Yeah. I love this democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. For Gen Zers, maybe for, for kids who are younger, I don't know if they realize like how rare this was at this time, right? Nowadays you have um you have Olivia Rodrigo getting up there and like shaming all of the Supreme Court justices and like calling them out. You know, this is a pretty regular thing. You also like regularly have Oscar speeches and award speeches that call attention to an issue or et cetera, et cetera. But Michael Moore in 2003, getting up there and just so honestly and brazenly calling out George Bush for his lies, for the Bush administration lies, and for the fictitious reason that we were over in the Middle East was like truly giga chad based you know it, it was something that was incredibly brave and it was what Michael Moore was known for though his whole thing was getting up there and just skewering the lies that have been sold to us from those in political power and then you know those in power in Hollywood who propagate those lies, they they work in tandem together. And there's also just a lot more people now in the space who do like what Michael Moore does, right? But back in the day, Michael Moore really was a one of a kind. His whole thing was being controversial. And nowadays, because we're all, you know, there's lots of woke giga chads, he would never be seen as controversial today. Yeah, and same with the Dixie Chicks, right? The Dixie Chicks coming out and saying that they were shamed for George W. Bush to be from Texas which got them canceled. Truly, the Dixie Chicks were canceled before cancel culture ever was a thing. There were other people in the industry who were left-leaning, who were whatever progressives would have been considered back then, but no one really seemed to, to be as aggressive about it as Michael Moore. Michael Moore makes documentaries that change the world. To his skills as a world-class director. So Michael Moore was honored in 2018 with a Life Achievement Award from the Critics' Choice. Writer and actor, he adds the passion of a singular campaigner for decency and humanity. He has a nose for hypocrisy, and when he sniffs it out, he has the righteous warrior's strength to smash it. Watch how he does it. Lifetime Achievement Award, Michael Moore. I made Roger and Me, Michael Moore. Yeah, so so let me let me know about. You never this. heard of it, did you? Huh. My, my movie, That's Roger right. and Me. Roger and Me. About General Motors. Oh, you did that. Crimes have been committed in this building. I am here to make a citizen's arrest. I'm trying to get members of Congress to get their kids to enlist in the uh, army and uh, go over to Iraq. Should you have weapons, great plutonium? That should be restricted. You got some kind of credentials you should uh, give me? So I gave Mr. Slaughter my discount pass to Chuck E. Cheese, but he said that wouldn't get me into see. Like, y'all, Michael Moore was the man on the street before you had, like, long before you had people like All Gas, No Breaks, and, you know, Andrew Callahan. Like, Michael Moore paved the way for this man on the street type interviews, Jordan Klepper, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Mr. Smith. This is all off from Could you come up to Flint? I cannot come to Flint, I'm sorry. Yeah, that that's was me. That's famous. Yeah. That's Are you right. gonna make me famous now? Yeah, well, look what happened to him. Don't do that. <laughs> Can I help you? Uh, yeah, I'm here to open up an account. Okay, what type of account would you like? Um, yeah, I want the account where I can uh, get the uh, free gun. Okay. <laughs> The account where I can get wow. the free gun. Sweet. Well, here's my first question. Do you think it's a little dangerous handing out guns in a bank? Yes. How the f did this happen? <laughs> I'm proud to present the Critics' Choice Documentary Lifetime Achievement Award to a true, true American hero, Michael Moore. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, thank you for being one of the 
greatest truth tellers in this country right now. Um, we all love you for it. I was trying to figure out what to, uh, to say tonight or what to write and to try to keep it under two hours and eight minutes. Uh, and then I had this idea and I got up this morning and went uh, rummaging through all these uh, bankers boxes and uh, files that I knew I had kept this and then I found it. And it, 15 years ago, on March 23rd, 2003, the fifth night of the Iraq war, I won the Oscar for Bowling for Columbine. And I went up to the stage. Within a few seconds, was I was being booed. And then <laughs> I was really being booed. And there were some people applauding. I heard those. But that was then the band started playing. The microphone started going down into the stage. And if you remember that year, they didn't want to hold the Oscars because of, obviously the, we were invading a country. Uh, optics were wrong. And uh, they decided to have the Oscars, but they decided not to do the documentary awards at the show. And then, so there was a big kerfuffle about that, if you remember, and then, because they were worried about you, basically, any of us uh, who make documentaries, they do not want us up on an international stage like that. And then they decided to put the documentaries back in the show. And then they announced my name, and I went up there, and I began to give the speech, and all chaos broke loose, and I was yanked from the stage. <laughs> I never got to finish that speech. And I, when I got up this morning, I thought that I know I kept it. I know it's somewhere. Three and a half hours later, I found it. So if you wouldn't mind, I've never been able publicly to give the, the rest of the speech. If I could now here for the first time ever is the rest of my Oscar speech. So before I close, see, I was closing. I want to say a few words about nonfiction and how to use it as a cure for the many lies we are being told and as a nonviolent weapon of revolution and change. I have read over the years that my first movie, Roger and Me, kicked open the doors for documentary films, the first documentary to be widely distributed in the shopping mall cinemas and multiplexes of America. The Academy, though, has not let me in as a member for 13 long years. I didn't know that. Not until just last month. I heard all the reasons why. Roger and me, it's not a documentary. Roger and me, documentaries are not supposed to be entertainment. You're using your frivolous humor, and it lessens the seriousness and the impact of what you're trying to say, et cetera, et cetera. Those of us from the now dead factory towns of the Rust Belt who, like me, have just a high school education, I barely made it out of my senior year. I flunked English and I flunked math, but I got a D in French. So we from the working class immediately know the class-based tone of those who speak to us, those who went to the finer schools or even any school at all. I encourage everyone watching at home tonight in the Gary Indianas of America, in the Camden, New Jerseys, in the San Ysidros, the East St. Louises, and yes, the Flints and the Detroits and the Pontiacs and the Dearborns, to pick up a camera and fight the power, make your voice heard, and stop this senseless war. Thank you and good night. And that was the end of the speech <laughs> that I didn't get to give. And I thought I would just be carried off on the shoulders of, of Robert De Niro. <laughs> Meryl Streep was standing. She was applauding. She also applauded for uh, later Roman now, Polanski. Tonight. We are not only still at war, but we have a president who's declared war on our democracy and war on us. Keep picking up those cameras, everyone here in this room, because the people gathered here tonight, you may be America's last line of defense and hopefully the first line of rebuilding this country that he is currently destroying. I will join you. Thank you very much for this recognition, and thank you for letting me finally finish my Oscar speech. We actually need to talk about a third moment because it also involved Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody was nominated for his role in The Pianist. He was nominated for Best Actor, and he wins. Halle Berry goes to hand him his Oscar, but she doesn't even get a chance because he wraps his arms around her and plants a kiss on her lips. A kiss that lasted way too long, mind you.
Afterwards, you can see Hallie is very confused and is laughing uncomfortably, but the audience has responded with enthusiastic applause. Years later, in 2017, Halle Berry appears on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen. A fan in the audience asked Halle Berry if the kiss with Brody was planned. Halle Berry responds, No, that was not planned. I knew nothing about it. I was like, what the f*** is happening right now? That is what was going through my mind. Because I was there the year before, I know that feeling of being out of your body. I just went with it. But I was like, what the fuck is going on right now? Andy Cohen then asks Halle Berry, because this is the most Andy Cohen thing for him to do, well, how was the kiss? Halle responded, I don't know. I was too focused on what the f*** was going on. I don't even know. So clearly Halle was not too enthused with the fact that Adrian Brody kissed her on the lips without her knowledge on a stage in front of their peers and televised to the whole wide world. Now, did Adrian Brody regret either the kiss or his support of Roman Polanski? In 2015, Brody spoke with Vanity Fair reflecting on the infamous moment. Can I ask you a little bit about Oscar night? Have you seen Halle Berry recently? No. What is a memory of that? That sure was the, probably the, one of the most memorable moments ever. You could say time slowed down, that was that moment where I really, really felt it slow down. In mm -hmm. fact, it must have because by the time I got finished kissing her and people kind of settled in, they were already flashing the sign to say, get off the stage, your time is up. It was amazing to have the presence of mind to be able to convey the things that I wanted to share because, you know, it is a enormous amount of pressure somehow. And, and you're also, I mean, I was also preparing myself to not Prevail. So clearly Brody has come to his senses and that he should apologize to Halle Berry. Oh wait, never mind. Nope, he sees absolutely nothing wrong with it. Even though in recent years, he has come under fire for his decision to kiss Barry without her permission. He's also come under fire for his relationships with directors Woody Allen and Roman Polanski and how he doesn't seem to have a problem with the fact that they are predators. So that is uh, the Oscar controversy in 2003.